Greetings, everybody. I hope you can hear me okay. It's great to be speaking with you again today. We've got a great topic for you this evening or this morning or this afternoon, depending where you are. Um, my name's Ryan. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm just outside London today in the UK. Maybe you guys can let me know where you are in the world. So hello, Tanya. Hello, Susan from Scotland. Beautiful Scotland. And who else have we got? Yaroslav. Thanks for the pizza. Hello, Carla from Portugal. That's great. So something about me. My name is Ryan and I've been a teacher, teacher, trainer and manager for in many, many years now. Uh, some would say too many, but uh, I've been in the industry for quite a, a while now and I still very much enjoy what I do. And as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about teaching online today. It's a very, very hot topic. I'm sure it's it's very useful for lots of people out there that are teaching at the moment. Um, maybe you could just tell me in the chat as well, if you've had any experience with teaching online uh, at all over the last year or a couple of years, just let me know. Um, who else have we got here? We've got Laura from Washington, Washington State. Hello, Laura. We've got people from all over, from Cornwall in England, from France. Fantastic. Zimbabwe, from the Caribbean. Oh, what a great location. Um, we've got Christoph from Greece. And he's been teaching online since 2015. So great experience there from Christos. Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, but um, you know who you are. You've been doing a level five now, have no clue how to teach online yet. Well, I hope that at the end of today's webinar, you'll have a slightly better idea. I hope that it's useful for you. Uh, Rachel is from South Africa. Well, that's fantastic. Okay, well, let's get straight into it. Teaching online. All right. So, very, very important subjects. So, a few things that we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about why it's a good idea for us to teach online. Um, we're going to talk about some of the techniques um, and about how to do that. If you've never done that before, you'll be able to get started today, hopefully after some basic um, information. Um, we'll, we'll talk about things that you need to think about before you start. So there's a kind of practical considerations about online safety, about setting up your, your systems and uh, your platforms. Um, and then we'll, hopefully we'll have a few top tips for teaching English online. Um, and at the end, as always, we'll have a, a question and answer session and also any of your comments as well. If you've got any comments that you'd like to make about your experiences, perhaps if you've been teaching online. OK, that's great. Very fantastic turnout today. People from all over, from China, from South Africa, the US in Iran. This is really fantastic. It gives me such a boost to see people from all over the world. OK, well, we know that teaching online, it's it's no secret anymore. It's the, it's been rising and rising, especially over the last couple of years with uh, the uh, the the word that begins with C. We all know what that is. Uh, many of us have been locked down in different countries. Uh, lots of educational institutions have have gone online or created blending learning environments for their their their, their students. Um, so it's been around for 
for quite a, a while now. It's become much more popular, I, I think, in the last couple of years. Um, it, more people are starting to realize that they're not bound by a single location. They can teach from anywhere. They can be in any country. Um, they can they can travel. They can they can move around the globe. Um, they can support themselves. They can work. Um, and it's a very flexible um, solution for lots of people out there. Um, so it, it's kind of mm, perhaps slightly different from the traditional route for uh, TEFL teachers teaching English uh, as a foreign language, um, where people go to a different country, they find a job, um, and then they move on to another destination. Um, if you teach online, you might be ba you might want to be based in one country, or you might want to be based in several countries. It it really doesn't matter. You've got that enormous flexibility to 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 carry on to teach, to have your 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 skills and experience transferred to your students, and you can be just about anywhere. Um, so we're going to talk about a few of those things today. Okay. So why should we teach English online? OK, well, of course, there's been a dramatic increase in online teaching, as I mentioned, uh, over the last few years. Um, the, the market is growing every year, you know, 15 and 20 percent increase each year. Um, we I think we'll see that slow down slightly as people go back to the universities, go back to school, go back to their their language learning in a, in a traditional classroom. But I think still more and more people will be learning and teaching online uh, because it, it doesn't have to be one or the other, does it? It could be a learning uh, and blended learning process um, because we we live in the world now which is dominated by computers by being online you know i can't remember the last time i was completely offline at any time and it can be quite bad sometimes but that's just the world that we're living in so we might as well embrace that as teachers and and educators so it's a great idea to kind of transfer your skills because the demand is out there um, so the market is huge over almost uh, eight and a half billion dollars amount of value in the market last year. So it, who knows what it is at the moment? It must be approaching 10 billion, I would bet. So it's a, it's a fascinating and great opportunity. Um, so we should also talk about the flexibility um, of living and working. Um, we might be fitting our online teaching around a more traditional teaching path. We might have um, a, another job that we need to do. We not, might have different family commitments. We might want to be really flexible in how we approach our teaching. So this is a great uh, way to do that. We can cut down on commuting time, we don't have to be in a physical location. Um, there, are, there are no restrictions. You can fit in your teaching around your lifestyle. Um, you can be in control to a certain extent of where and when you work. And there's been lots of talk of, as well about being a digital nomad. So being a traveler, um, a world traveler, a perpetual traveler uh, and working on your laptop, anywhere that you lay your hat in the world. It's digital nomad, what a great idea. You know, it's really, really possible. Lots of people are doing it these days. There's no restrictions to where you live, basically speaking. As long as you look at the, uh, mm, the visa situations and so on, we talk a little bit about that later. Um, you can, the, if you have family living abroad, you can go and visit them on a more regular basis without interrupting your workflow and without interrupting your work schedule too much. You can bounce around different countries, different continents and really carry on working. It's fantastic. 
So those are the main reasons why we might want to teach online. Um, and also, it's much more flexible for our students, not only for the teachers. Uh, your students have busy lives as well. And if they've got an option to learn online, then uh, they're going to take that as well, because they, that can fit in with their lifestyles too, um, especially if they want extra tuition. Uh, maybe they're all already on an English langu language learning course, but they want some additional, perhaps one-to-one -one teaching. Great webinar coming up on one-to-one -one teaching, by the way. Don't miss that one. Um, so it's great for it's a great solution for everybody. So let's talk a little bit about how to teach online. Well, there there are many different ways to do that. There are two main re, uh, ways or methods how to teach online. The first one is, is obviously to work for a company. OK, there are so many companies out there that offer work for teaching online. Um, so you can sign up, you can have a look. There are hundreds out there um, all over the world. Um, and this is the most obvious way to start if you if you haven't taught online already. So there's a huge variety out there. You need to be able to do your research to see if it's a good company or not. Uh, do they have a good reputation? Do they have reviews? Maybe you can speak to someone or read about someone's experience of working for that company. Um, you could look at different rates of pay, which are very, very varied, you know, the, depending on your experience as well. Uh, there are different um, demands for different kind of teaching, for academic, for business language teaching, um, for obviously young learners. Um, so have a look at what's out there. Um, so you will be employed by these companies. Um, and they might have certain requirements that you have to fulfill in terms of your experience or your uh, your time availability. They might ask for a demo lesson, for example. So um, I think uh, we've got something out there from the TEFL Academy about creating your demo lesson, which is really helpful. Um, so once you're on there, you've filled out all of the forms, you've had a demo lesson, um, and you're ready to teach. So you'd be able to kind of in, book uh, students. Students will be able to book lessons with you. Um, and sometimes this is kind of the the more you uh, are successful with your students and get good feedback and good reports back to the company, the more likely it is that you're going to have students book lessons with you. Um, and this is also reflective on your your progression, the company and so on, uh, and your pay. Perhaps there are different uh, pay scale rates for how many lessons you book and so on. It really does vary quite a lot. So check out what's out there in terms of working for a company. Um, there are many different uh, ways to get bonuses as well um, if you work for a company. Um, you <laughs> First thing is to be punctual, be on time and be organized for your lessons. Uh, giving good feedback to your your students as well, you know, be, being professional as, as, as much as possible, um, having a good internet connection and so on, which we'll talk about also a bit later as well. So that's one way to work, work for a company. They do all of the, the kind of background work. They've got their, their platform. They've got uh, the, the students lined up ready to, how to learn English. Um, and then you do your demo lesson and um, get on with the company and uh, hopefully book lots of lessons. So the other side of that coin is to bypass the company and work for yourself, be an independent freelance uh, English language teacher online. So um, there, there are pros and cons with this approach. Um, it's a great to be able to, to be independent. Um, you can control a lot of things yourself, but it does mean that you have to do quite a lot of the work yourself in the beginning as well. And it can be quite daunting for someone who doesn't have the experience of building a website and so on, or to be able to do marketing, because if you work for yourself and you're generating your own work, 
you'll need to, to think about how you're going to market yourself and put yourself out there on the internet and find learners. Okay, so um, one of the ways, I think it's quite easy these days to, to start to build a website, to get online, to get a domain name, um, uh, and, and to build a basic website, uh, places like Squarespace, Wix, and uh, WordPress, and so on. There are many, many of them out there for you to build a basic website. And many of them have functionality that allows you to, to, to build in the marketing to that. So email campaigns, um, don't forget about your social media as well. Obviously, you'll need to support that uh, to make a Facebook channel, Instagram, maybe TikTok. Um, make um, a bit profile for yourself on LinkedIn. Um, you, you need to kind of don't be afraid to put yourself out there because you need to get noticed. It could be quite a crowded marketplace out there. Um, the demand is still there, most definitely, as we've seen. But uh, as more teachers go to online teaching, uh, it can be a bit crowded. So you have to get yourself out there and, and do some good marketing. Um, you also need um, to put a lot of energy into this as well, especially in the beginning, to build your momentum. So you need to put in some time of your own, creating content, uh, writing the, the copy for the website, uh, posting on a regular basis online on your social media. Um, so you need to kind of uh, be aware of that and put the work in. Um, there, are, there are other potential places for you to, uh, to market yourself. There are other platforms out there um, where you can kind of promote yourself. You're kind of semi-independent where you can be on the listing and people can choose you and then they can and the the platform will take a commission of your bookings for that so there there are different ways to do that um and um but i think if you want to kind of avoid all of the companies all the platforms and give away your commission uh, the way to go is to be independent this way you can set your own pay rates of course you know you can decide what your your time is worth, what your experience, what your skill is worth. Um, you can set your own schedule. Um, depending on your your schedule, you'll need to be quite organized. You'll need to find a way how to organize your schedule and make sure students know when you're available. So this could be online calendars, building this into your website, um, having timetables and schedules online so people can automatically book a lesson with you. Um, just coming back to the marketing, you might want to give away free lessons in the beginning and give away some free content. So this might be lesson plans, this might be um, an e a short ebook, for example, that people can download. This might be vi posting videos um, on Instagram and Facebook. Um, and then this way you can build up a following and then you can start to promote your kind of paid for content, your lessons, whether that's one to one teaching or as a group as well. If, you, if you're if you doing one to one teaching, be aware that the, the costs are going to be quite different between someone who wants to book a one to one lesson and someone who wants to just join a group. So be be aware about that. Um, and also don't undersell yourself is what I would say. Uh, don't be afraid to kind of um, give yourself the value you, you, that you think you deserve and your talents deserve um, because it has to be worth your while. It has to be um, something that can sustain you in the long run. So you can always have promotions and things like that, but I, I would say, you know, know your value. Um, the other thing to mention is, of course, that there's lots of administration involved in working for yourself. There are bills to pay. There are um, costs involved that you need to keep track of. There is invoicing for, for your students and so on. Um, so you need to have a bit of time set aside for all of the back end stuff as well, all the ad administrations. So um, 
on the flip side of that though it, it's totally in your control um so you can set your own agenda you can set your own pay rates and you can set your own schedule aside for when you'd like to to do this side of the business okay so that's basically the the choice um of course you can combine these two things there's no restriction um depending on the company they might not uh, be very favorable um towards you having your own presence online maybe that's totally fine again you'll have to do your own research um but that's basically the choice so i th i think it could be a case of in the beginning you might want to work for a company see how that it all works see what the processes are what's involved um uh, build up your confidence build up your working style your setup as well um and see how you feel about it before jumping in uh, starting your own websites marketing yourself uh, and creating your own company um, again with the, the working for yourself as well that you might need to create a kind of legal entity for yourself it might be a company it might be a freelance basis you have to think about these things as well Well, let's talk about a few things that you should bear in mind when you're teaching online. Okay, so the first one is, is quite obvious. It's to think about the time zones. So you might be based in Europe, where, but most of your students or a lot of your students might be based in uh, the Americas or in the, the Far East. So the time difference, if the time zones are completely different, so your American students might be having morning lessons, but it will be the afternoon or evening for you. And and also if you're teaching uh, people from the other side of the, the world, it will be much later for them, but earlier for you. So obviously you need to think about these things and make sure that your students are aware of the different time differences as well. So you might choose to be to um, to um, put a very prominent time of your lessons on your website for example um, also if you're teaching for a company as we've mentioned uh, just bear that in mind there are lots of companies based in 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 asia in the far east where the time zones are very different so you need to bear that in mind make yourself available for those times um, you don't want to be kind of teaching at three o'clock in the morning uh, hopefully not anyway maybe that works for you it wouldn't work for me because i'm i'm not very good at that time in the morning unfortunately hmm. but uh, it might work for you but bear that in mind uh, we need to think about visas as well um, if we are teaching in a different country even if it's online um, we, you need to be able to be uh, working in that country um, so please check out the visa situation. You can look on the government websites as well. And there's lots of information on the, the TEFL Academy uh, website about that as well. Um, so one country's laws might be very relaxed uh, compared to another country's. Um, there might be um, a time limit. So if you want to spend time, an extended period of time in one particular country, you need to be aware of the visa situation, um, especially if you go down the digital nomad routes. There, there are visas out there um, more tailored towards being a nomad and having a, a kind of nomadic uh, working lifestyle. So you can check those out. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is the cost of living. So obviously this can vary wildly depending where you are in the world. Um, and um, especially if you have your own business, the, the the cost of doing business might be different in different countries as well. Um, if you are earning uh, dollars, for example, or pounds or euros, but um, you're living in a country with a different currency, that might work very well for you. Um, the opposite could be true as well. You might be living in a more expensive country. Um, so you bear that, take that into consideration. You can leave 
the great thing about the world today is that there's lots of leverage out there in terms of how you work and get the, the most bang for your buck, if you know what I mean. So you could be living quite cheaply, but earning pretty good money in a different currency. So that's something to worth thinking about. There are many great resources out there for looking at the cost of everyday items like your groceries, um, vegetables, um, basic living requirements, co uh, cost of uh, your rent and so on, and your bills. So you can make a calculation and see if that works for you. So the other, another thing to think about is stuff. Now, uh, we people usually have lots of stuff. So if you're going down the digital nomad routes, you might want to think about having a bit of a declutter maybe, or if you're more inclined to be the minimalist type, that's great, that's more in tune with being a digital nomad. But if you have do have fit stuff and items and furniture that you do want to, to have, when, if you return to, to your country, you'll need to think about storage, uh, and a place to keep all of your things. Um, you know, it's the great idea to just to travel with just a pack on your back. It's a great feeling, um, but be aware if you are moving for a prolonged period of time to a different country, you need to think about all of your home uh, stuff, your creature comforts and so on. Think about your luggage as well if you're traveling. Maybe you like to travel light or maybe you need a little bit more support when you go away. It's worth thinking about. Um, connectivity, obviously, is very important. So um, we, as we talk about, it's very, very important to have the right setup. And this includes being connected and having a very good internet connection wherever you are in the world. So this can vary um, uh, quite a lot depending on where you are. Um, some places have be in in the country as well have have better internet connectivity than other parts of of the country. Um, so you need to think about this. If you're staying in a hotel or a hostel, for example, um, check out what the internet is there. What if they've got good Wi-Fi connectivity? Um, because you don't want to let your your students down, or you don't want to let down. A company that you're working for because this is this is uh i've been in teaching online for quite a time now and it, it you know sometimes it's out of your control what happens to your connectivity but it is very frustrating um and this works both way as well if you build up your clients and your customers and your 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 learners um your students will need to have good connectivity as well um you might want to make that um, a requirement before you start lessons with them because it really is much more conducive to having great lessons online if everything is working very well. Um, so the last thing on the list is to have um, a, a nice working environment. Uh, not too much noise. It's got to be comfortable. Um, to um, to make everything go as smoothly as possible um, and this could be quite ch challenging if you're on the move all of the time if you're traveling around you might not know where you're going to be necessarily the next day so you have to think about this um, is it going to be possible to find a quiet place to teach um, um, the easy solution is to to, to search for private workspaces where you are. So there might be co-working spaces available. There might be offices that you can use, for example. Um, but you need to cut down on the noise, make sure there's no traffic noise coming from outside. Um, invest in a really good pair of headphones would be my advice as well. Um, to make things go as smoothly as possible. Okay. All right. Well. We're going to go on to a few tips now, a few other things to think about when teaching online. All right. We need to think about the platform and some of the tools that we're using. So there are so many out there. Um, there are kind of learning um, 
environments, uh, learning management systems, LMS, uh, things like Google Classroom, Moodle, Canvas, Edmodo, Blackboard, the list goes on. There are many of them out there. What I would suggest is check them out, see which one is, is suitable for your needs. Does it feel right? Uh, does it have the functionality that you need? Maybe you want a very simple, slimmed down platform. Um, maybe you don't need a, a really complicated platform at all in the beginning. Maybe you just need to keep yourself organized. Um, things like uh, the Google, uh, doc, Google Docs and Google Sheets, these are really good free resources that you can use as well. Um, the other thing to think about is um, that uh, you might need to, to up your skills as well. You might need to spend some time researching what platform you're going to use. Um, when it comes to actually delivering your lessons, there are also a lot of options. Of course, there's Zoom, there is Skype, Google Meet, there are Microsoft Teams and so on. Um, again, they're all, all quite similar, but they have different function functionality, you know, do things quite differently. Um, but some of them are not necessarily designed for teaching as well. So bear that in mind. Um, you might want to be able to share your screen, have breakout rooms, so have a virtual whiteboard. Um, there's some really great sites out there as well. Um, if you don't have that functionality built in to your video conferencing software, you can go to a website, for example, share that screen and use that as a whiteboard um, and other things like this. But please bear this in mind. Uh, you also need to think about kind of tools for the classroom. Um, if you've done classroom teaching, you might have used these before as well. So things like uh, Kahoot, Quizlet, uh, Padlet, um, there, there are many platforms out there that you can use to kind of gamify, gamification of your, of your lesson. Um, you can generate your own quizzes, you can make challenges and extra kind of uh, content in the lesson for your, for your students. It is especially important, I think, if you're if you're teaching young learners to keep them engaged. Um, these are, can be great fun as well and very, very useful for getting your point across for your language points, for repetition, for homework and so on. So my advice is to, to have a look out there, try a few different ones and see what works for you. Another thing is very important is your setup. So obviously you're going to need a good PC, a good laptop, a, a good computer. Um, if you're a Mac person or if you're a PC person or you're a Linux person, that uh, you can make that decision what works best for you. Uh, but it, it should be um, something that you're uh, able to use and it has good, it's fast enough. Uh, I would say that tablets might be an option if, you, if you're pressed. Uh, a tablet is much more portable, of course, but it might not necessarily have all of the functionality that you would get from a, a kind of full laptop or a PC. So bear that in mind. Um, of course, of course, we're going to need a fast and reliable internet connection. Um, we don't want any undue interruptions in our learning. So uh, make sure you you kind of you've got this on hand. If you're working from home, you might need to upgrade your your broadband. Um, you might need to think about the speed. You can check your speed. There are many great websites for checking your internet speed. Um, and as I mentioned, also um, encourage your students to also have a very good internet connection. This may seem obvious, but um, it's worth reminding. Uh, yourself and your students about this and check it, um, especially if it's not so reliable. You might have a good internet speed, but it comes in and out. So this might be to due to your environment or where you're teaching. And if you're traveling around, make sure that you can be in a place with a good connection. So as I mentioned, also uh, a great headset of uh, headphones are very valuable. 
Um, you might want to have a, a separate webcam as well. Now, laptops have really good webcams integrated these days, but you might want to have a dedicated webcam as well, nice, great quality with uh, good lighting and so on. Um, if you uh, uh, want to offer a different angle, for example, you might have a second webcam, which is focused on a piece of work, for example, and you can switch between the two. If you want to show your students what you've written down, for example, or uh, you want to work on something uh, spontaneously, a second webcam might be a good option. Um, invest in your sitting posture. Um, it's very important to be comfortable when you're working. Uh, we don't want to be sitting down all the time, but when we do, we need to be comfortable. Um, we need to have a comfortable workspace as well. A very comfortable workspace. Everything that you need is on hand um, to make your lessons go very smoothly. Um, maybe you need some props on, or um, realia to show your students. Um, and also we need to think about a background as well. So um, depend, you might have a green screen background. You might want to use a virtual background um, or just blur the background in some, uh, some platforms allow you to make a blurred black background. Um, but if you can't do that, make sure that there's not many, too many distractions going on in your background. It should be as professional as possible. Uh, today, I've tried to, to make a kind of minimalist look for my background, not too many distracting things going on. Um, you'll need to think also about your notes and your materials as well in your setup. Make sure that you've got everything ready. This might be virtual materials that you can share on the screen. Um, you might want to be able to take notes as well um, and have everything ready for your lessons. OK, a quick note about uh, privacy and online safety. Um, so we've probably heard about GDPR, which is the General Protection, uh, General, General Data Protection Regulation. Um, so if you're setting up on your own, you might want to think about these, these provisions, these regulations. You should also think about personal data and what you share and what you ask your students to share online. Because once something is on the internet, it's there forever, basically speaking. So be careful about what you, you share. Um, sharing photos and videos as well, obviously. So. Uh, you need to have, for example, if you want to do some promotions or you want to share something online, you might need permission from the person to, before you do that. Um, of course, we should mention about uh, online bullying and a behavior online. So uh, cyberbullying, of course, is, is, uh, is something to be aware of. Um, hopefully it doesn't come to that. Um, if you're teaching children, though, it's worth having that in the back of your mind uh, if you're if you're teaching in groups and so on uh, and um, there are many great resources out there um, especially if um, if you if you've got uh, an online platform you're using using social media be aware about what's going on if you set up a group for example just take some time to understand what's going on there and and everything is as safe and as pleasant as possible for your students Uh, I think it's important to create a routine, um, especially if we're teaching in or out of a physical classroom. The same thing applies to our online teaching as well. We build up our certain routines. We, we, we do something in the beginning of the lesson, maybe quite consistently, for example. Um, this helps students feel safe, more relaxed, more at home. Um, and if, if we are teaching online, we can, can translate these, these practices, these routines to our online lessons too. Um, it's great as well for giving instructions. If you get into a kind of routine for checking instructions and so on after you've given a task, uh, your students will get used to this format and it will just make things go much more smoothly in the end. 
much more efficiently. Um, you might want to start with a warmer, for example. I mean, this is these are the basic building blocks of a lesson, but they still apply to your online lesson. Um, if you're teaching young learners, you might have a what are we learning today? A kind of Walt uh, template. Um, you might want to signpost what you're going to be talking about and learning in that lesson. Uh, you might have a set time in your lesson for talking or marking or discussing homework. And at the end of your lesson, you might want to have uh, a, a time where you can summarize what you've learned. Um, so do bear that in mind. Routines are generally a great idea for mm, your teaching, whether online or offline. OK, so let's talk about giving instructions. So um, online teaching kind of um, allows you to be a bit more um, precise with your instructions if if uh, if you need to get your instructions across very cl clearly. So we can give our instructions verbally um, and just like in the classroom, we can give them uh, written instructions as well. This could be on the blackboard if we're in a classroom, but these instructions could be in the chat box, for example. We can use the chat box for confirming our instructions, for checking our instructions. Um, you can ask them to um, ask if everything is clear. Um, you can get simultaneous feedback as well from your students if you, if you allow them to do that. Um, you can turn off or on the chat function in your classroom, which is something you can't do in the classroom, isn't it? Well, that would be great. There are many times that I would like students to stop chatting just to press a button. That would be fantastic, wouldn't it? Um, but we can do that online if that's what we want to do. Uh, we can definitely um, use that to our advantage. Um, but it's also to the student advantage. They can give their feedback in the chat box as well. Uh, the other great thing about uh, teaching online is we can share instantaneously, share our materials and share links and share content, share screens. So we can give our instructions on the screen as well once we go into a task just to, to, for more confirmation of those instructions. So we still need to manage our classroom online. Um, and as I mentioned, this can be a little bit more easier than in a classroom because we do have a mute function. We can turn uh, specific students' uh, microphones on and off. Uh, we, can sh we can make it possible to share video or not. Uh, there's lots of control that we've got. We can cut down on the kind of chatting that you might get um, and the lack of focus in a physical classroom. Um, so bear that in mind. I think it's worth setting this into your routines as well. So students know that there's a time for being muted and there's a time for interactive um, engagement with the teacher online and the other students as well. Um, there might be a time where you might want to put them into breakout rooms as well and so on. Um, so a great way to manage the classroom is to use the all of the functionality you've got at your fingertips. So um, you can use the chat box there. You can you can ask for individual students for their feedback and so on. Um, and all of the the tips about classroom management can be applied to the online classroom as well. Um, dealing with behaviour uh, and interruptions and so on. And also reinforcing uh, good work as well, good language use and so on. We can use these to manage our online lessons. Let's talk a little bit about student engagement. So uh, it can be, especially with um, younger learners, to engage your students, to get to hold their attention, to be engaged with a screen. You're not there in the physical world, your uh, face on a screen, and there are many distractions around. So one way to do this is to try to be larger than life, to kind of exaggerate your movements, uh, make sure that everything is clear. This goes back to your setup and your microphone settings. Um, you might 
want to ex exaggerate your movements and so on. Um, speak very clearly. Um, exaggerate your expressions, you know, like it, I'm sure that many of you have taught students before, young students, so you need to be a bit of an actor as well. And this certainly applies to your online lessons. Um, make them interesting. Try to engage them as much as you can, bearing in mind that you are online. We can nominate our students with the chat box, as, as we've mentioned. Uh, you can put students front and center if you like. They can be the focus for other students to engage with. Um, you can get things like virtual spinners to randomize who answers questions and who you nominate. This is quite fun. This, this is quite can be quite engaging, for example. Um, and the other thing I would mention is don't forget about those digital tools to incorporate them in your lessons. This, this can be engaging. When you see the focus waning and dipping a bit in your, in your lesson, it, you can introduce something that will get them back engaged in the screen. This could be a quiz or some, something in, really interesting and vibrant to look at. Um, the last point is, is what I always say as well in the classroom or the, the online classroom is don't be too afraid of silence in your lesson. Don't feel the need, especially in one-to-one -one teaching, to, to fill up every second with something, some sound, your, your voice or your student's voice. Just because your student is silent, it doesn't mean they're not learning. They only need time to think about their answers. They need time to think about the new language and generate their questions and their answers and so on. So please don't be afraid to have a little bit of silence in your lesson. OK, well, I hope that was useful. Let's just summarize a few things of what we've talked about here today. So we talked about why teaching English online um, is, a, is a good thing, why it's very important to add to our arsenal of skills and experience. Um, we talked about the need, the demand is out there, the huge market for online teaching. We talked about the different routes, how to get into online teaching, either working for a company or working for yourself as an independent uh, business owner and getting your own students. Um, we've talked about quite a lot of things to think about if you're aiming to travel around, um, to set up your environment, to think about the mm, visa situation, to, to set up your working systems and your, your working uh, schedules, um, and also about the currencies, different currencies and cost of living. Uh, and we've talked about a few tips for teaching online, engaging your students, managing your classes, using the different platforms. Okay, all right, well, let's get into a question and answer session now for you. So if you've got any questions or comments, now is the time. So let's see, we've got a comment from, from CECE. Let me just share that for you. So CE says, I have my teaching profile advertised on an online platform just for 80 euros per year, where students from all over Greece can check it and come in touch with a teacher and start English lessons. That's great. Thank you very much for that. That's very useful. Um, yeah, so this is what we discussed earlier, is having a profile on a platform that does the advertising for you. In this case, it sounds like they've got a set fee that they uh, propose for having you on a listing online and then students can come to you. That's very, very useful. Perhaps you can share what the name of the platform is and, and our, our viewers today can check that out. Um, so have any of you guys got any questions or comments about today's webinar? Here's a great question. What headset do you use, please? And does it have a built-in microphone? Great question. Oh, well, I'm using a very basic um, 
you've seen many of these around a bit old school because it has a, a cord but uh, i use uh, this headphone when i'm teaching it seems to work okay i hope that you can hear everything well um the thing about this one is it's not too expensive and it's very easy to carry around with me and i'm not too disappointed if i lose it or break it because i've got quite a few different ones of the same so i'm not worried about losing it but you might want to invest in something a bit more comfortable a bit more professional um you might want to have ones with a kind of built-in microphone that comes around like that so check out what's out there try a few different ones and see what works for you um uh, yep yeah, um i think it doesn't have to be costing the earth but um you might have your favorite type of microphone that you can use and you might want to suggest ones that your students use as well uh, just a comment here from judy thank you judy i enjoyed your well taught lesson thank you here's a question from kesia what are you what are your advice for new teachers starting out referencing to finding a job and where to sign up okay well a good place to start would be the tefl academy uh job sites uh, and read the advice there about uh, teaching teaching online and where to find jobs what to do in interviews uh, if you look on the youtube channel there is some advice about job interviews as well um, so my advice would be to look carefully at the company what are their values what are their pay rates what is the work system do they require demo what qualifications do they require um, and then hopefully you can check out and get some advice from people that have already worked there to to make a really good decision about that a very good question here's a question about brands what brands please recommend i too would keep the wires <laughs> okay yeah well i'm kind of an old school person uh i don't want to mess around with bluetooth all the time um as far as brands go um i don't think i'd like to recommend any single brands um we all know the big ones out there that um we might prefer to others as well but i think with anything in life you get for you get what you pay for in the end um and it's it's good to make a good investment in the beginning so that it doesn't break all the time it's reliable and you really get your value for money from that is my advice for that i wouldn't rec go ahead and recommend any particular brands here's a question about a chat box from yaroswab um how often should chat box be used i used it almost for everything i explain or correct um if that works for you then full steam ahead for you but i personally i wouldn't i don't think i would overuse the chat box i think use it in strategic parts of your lesson to get the best effect um i but if your students are kind of mm, they expect that then that's great as well um but i would use it i personally would use it sparingly in the lesson to re really make it work to really have an impact um it's great if, for example at certain points in the lesson when you want to have feedback from your from your students or in this case in a webinar in in a, a webcast to ask for questions in the q a session is to use the chat box um here's a question for Carla, let's see. Carla says, do you recommend having a small whiteboard that can stay behind us during the online lesson? Okay, yes. This is also a another solution to have a physical whiteboard that we can use. Um, what I would say, I've 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 done this before myself, um, and it does take some working out. You need it exactly exactly the right place in your your office or your your working environment make sure it's readable on the video uh, it's the right size it's the no glare coming off the, the screen or from the outside the lighting's got to be good your students will need to be able to read what's on that whiteboard so in the end i actually used a, a virtual whiteboard it's much more practical you can easily manipulate it you're there right there it's right on your screen and you're the great thing is about a virtual whiteboard is 
your students can use it as well. They they're not they're not uh, in the physical location, but they can all write and contribute to a physical whiteboard. But if that works better for you, why not? Um, it works quite well if you're making YouTube videos to supplement your lessons. Then you can set things up really well. A good question. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Did you ever use external wired microphones and speakers? And did you get feedback? External wired microphones. Hmm. Um, I, I guess you're thinking about the ones you see on the podcasts and so on. They look quite expensive. I haven't used those kinds before because I, I found that the microphones and, and headsets and earphones that I was been using work just pretty good anyway. But um, I, I think it does pay to invest in something that works for you. Um, and if that if something external works better for you and it gives a good result, then I would go ahead and use that. Why not? Um, let's see, Leo. As to the content of the courses, which is better? Pre-made course, pre-made courses like the well-known ones out there, or should I create my own online course content? Very good question. Um, I think if you're starting out and you haven't got a great experience of creating your own lesson content, um, then use what's out there. Um, there's no need to reinvent the wheel because quite a lot of resources are out there already, um, and we don't have to necessarily create new ones just for our lessons of course you can do that guys there's not much new under the sun is there if we're really honest about it if you can think about something that you need for your lesson it's probably all already existing out there on the internet so i would look at what's out there um as you get more confident you can create your own bespoke lesson plans and, and content and materials which is a lot also a lot of fun as well so Leo, that's what I would do. Use a combination of these things. Um, uh, you might, if you're setting out on your own, you need to maybe create your kind of brand as well to have your colors and your logo on your content. Maybe it's a particular way that you create slides or your how you get your lessons across. It's worth thinking about. Should there be any ground rules for the online lesson, how to enforce it? The answer is yes. Uh, just as that is the, how we would do in a physical classroom, we set out our classroom contracts in the, uh, the beginning of a new term or a new group. So things that we, we expect our students to do, be on time, uh, do their homework. Um, if we're kind of translating that to the online teaching world, it will be make sure that your your screen is on, make sure your video is on, um, make sure that your well, microphone is working, um, cut down on distractions out there, close the door to mum and dad, whatever it might be that you need your students to do. So I definitely set the ground rules. Orlando. Do you recommend teachers always appear on screen on screen during an online class? No, I don't think it's always necessary um, for for a teacher to be on screen. For example, if I wanted to share some content, I want that to be front and center. But there are some times when I want to share myself, or sometimes I want to be the focus of attention on the screen. Um, so, I think. It depends on what particular stage of the lesson you are. Um, I think it's best if you want your students' attention to put yourself front and centre at particular parts of the lesson, if that makes sense. Uh, let's see. Susan, much food for thought. Thank you. And missed of level five. Lots of people on level five. <laughs> OK, that's great. Well, good luck with the course. Thank you for your comment. Appreciate it very much. Sean says, what content did you get from Canva? Oh, yes, I didn't mention Canva. It was for advertising materials. Yes, you're quite right, Sean. Thank you for pointing that out. Canva is, is a kind of uh, platform for creating um, slides and marketing materials. So it's not so much a tool for 
uh, giving quizzes and challenges in your lesson. It's more of a marketing tool. Yeah, you're quite right to point that out. Thank you, Sean. Um, but this is, you could use Canva, for example, for te making templates of your, your lesson plans and your presentations online. Um, and also for making your, um, your social media posts. Um, you might want to take snippets from your lesson and put those online and Canva can help with that. Yeah. But uh, bear, th bear that in mind. It's a, it's a predominantly a marketing tool. That was a great presentation. I need, I need to go now. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining. Uh, there will be an, another online session. Yes. I think I will be back again shortly along with our fellow presenters. Um, let's have one, a couple more questions before we go. If I want to work for a company, will they provide the course content or will I? Can you suggest the main websites to provide course content, please? OK, so it depends on the company. Many companies will have their lessons pre-planned and you have to deliver them quite strictly. Some companies will be quite flexible. Some companies might expect you to come up with all of the content yourself. So it's worth doing the research with that. Um, Hopefully you'll have a bit of flexibility in your on your online teaching. Um, can I suggest the main websites to go to? Well, Teffel Academy, of course. Uh, and uh, the usual ones, the British Council website is very good. Uh, BBC Learning English. Um, there are some other great ones out there from the publishers, so Oxford and Cambridge. Um, and the, all of the usual suspects have great resources out there for teaching uh english um yeah i think um it will be uh good to experiment and see use a variety of different resources out there and see what works best for your style of teaching okay well time flies wow amazing okay thanks very much for all of your comments today it's been a pleasure to speak with you as usual and hopefully i'll hear from you again very soon have a great weekend wherever you are and uh, take care. I'm just going to leave you with. A survey request, so if you could please tell us what you think about today's webinar, give us the feedback It's very much appreciated. So if you can navigate your way to the QR code or go to the link. Uh, let us know how we are doing with these webinars. We're always listening to our audience. So if we can make uh, improvements, that will be fantastic. Thank you so much.